In the middle of June back in 2012, I received a job offer after a week of searching. It was barely after graduating university from a Bachelor of Science. Riddled with debt and sinking into the sorrows of unemployment, I snatched at the opportunity to earn a decent keep. When I saw the price tag on the job, a decent keep seemed like pocket change. I cannot emphasize how suspicious and ludicrous the pay was, but also how down on my luck I've been as far as jobs were concerned. I'm talking a six-digit payoff for a few days of work. Sign me up. I called the number written on the email as instructed. It rung a few times, but eventually, a sharp-voiced lady answered in a friendly enough tone. Welcome to Keelan Research Center. How may I take your call? I was taken aback. This sounded official. I realized either this was a very complicated ploy to kidnap me, extort me, or a very lucky employment opportunity. All three were better than being unemployed for another day. So I went through the recruitment process, and before I knew it, I was on a plane to Alice Springs in the Northern Territory of Australia. Two other scientists were on the plane with me. A young, very very young Asian man with slick black hair and white rimmed glasses covering a pair of brown eyes. Adjacent to him and across from me, a sharp eyed woman in her thirties wearing a suit with dirty blonde hair and hazel eyes locked onto a pristine newspaper. The Asian man was very intently tapping away at his laptop, and the two made me feel very unprofessional in comparison. We'd exchanged simple greetings, but I decided to introduce myself before I developed some kind of inferiority complex. So uh, who do I have the pleasure of flying with this morning? I said, with what I hoped was a professional and sophisticated smile. Oh, of course, of course. The Asian man piped up, eyes darting from his laptop to me. I'm Wen Young. I just finished my master's last month, but I'm here on account of my drilling experience. I reached out and shook his hand, while wondering what a drilling expert and a geographical scientist like myself could possibly be doing in Alice Springs. Our other companion cleared her throat. Elara Perot. She said, shaking my hand. I'll be helping with any technological aspects of the project. Speaking of which, do either of you know the objective? I shook my head, mentioning we might receive it when we arrived. The two agreed, and we settled in for the trip. We left the airport as quick as we arrived, meeting a man whose sign had all three of our names written on it. He instructed us to proceed to the taxi bay. There, we went to the vehicle he described, notably one without a driver, and got in. The doors weren't even locked. That's a bit strange, Wen said, sitting down in the front seat after calling shotgun. Must be a note around here somewhere. It's like a treasure hunt, hey? Elara gave him a stern look from the back of the car but quickly discovered a large white envelope on the seat. Inside was a tablet with three boxes on the screen. She moved it to the middle of the car so we could all get a better look. The first box read, message one, and the other two, two and three respectively, albeit grayed out. We agreed to try the first message. Message one. Depart from Alice Springs at 2200 using the provided transport. A location has been entered into the issued vehicle's GPS, which will be your first and final destination. You will arrive at 0530. Provisions are in the trunk. The second instruction will be deciphered on arrival. Seeing it was 2200, and with nothing else to go on but a sudden and sharp air of suspicion, we followed the instructions. The drive took a few hours, and I wasn't used to driving on Australian terrain. It was all rocky and weird, yet flat. The GPS said we were headed into Western Australia, 
across the Tanamai Desert. As per the instructions, we arrived at 0530. Well, more like 0540, but arriving right on time was a shot in the dark. The sun was hopefully making an effort to crawl up. A sudden beep from the tablet caught our attention, and we all shook off to sleep as sufficiently as possible. The second message was no longer grey. We clicked it. Message 2 Congratulations on reaching your destination. In the cargo crate located in the trunk labeled Young is a high capacity power drill set. Deploy it 75 meters from your vehicle on flat slate of ground. Upon activation, the final instruction will be decrypted. Alarm bells go off in your head? Sure happened to me. But I bit my tongue on the thought of the money. I know it was cheap and selfish, not to mention dangerous. But neither Wynn nor Elara spoke up either. So it was safe to say they had the same thing in mind. We stepped out of the car and walked the distance we had to, before stopping and letting Wynn do his thing. I carried the lantern I'd procured from the trunk and observed the dusty landscape as we waited. No one would be around for miles. Wen put down the large, complex metallic object he'd been carrying and fixated it to the ground with a series of spiked clamps. The cylindrical shape of it resembled a large drain pipe, but the metal cap on top was clearly designed to be open. The scientist attached another device to the top before giving us the thumbs up. That's it? I asked. Elara, what does the tablet say? The woman gave me a disgruntled look, brushing the fringe of hair to the side. Nothing yet, she said before pausing. It beeped. Okay, the third message. It says, Ah, well done for deploying the drill correctly. Open the crate labeled Carter and Perot. Retrieve the item from Carter's crate and, using the equipment provided in the rear of the vehicle, Lower it down the hole and relay the results to Perot's item. I think we should head back to the car then? Elara asked, squinting her eyes to the contrast between artificial and natural light. When nodded. I'll wait here, Jaskus. Well, I want to make sure this is 100% ready to go. It's simple enough, but I've never used this particular model before. Carter, could you leave the lantern? I obliged, setting it down next to him. Alara turned and started heading back to the car, as I followed. I wanted to maintain an air of professionalism, since she seemed to be quite the opposite of the head out and make friends in the middle of nowhere type scientist. But my suspicions were naturally making me eager to talk openly. Buttoning down the caution, I headed to the rear of the trunk with her. Inside were two crates we'd seen earlier, marked with our names. Elara opened hers first. It's a laptop, I declared, peering over her shoulder. Control terminal, she sharply corrected. Used for relaying data between different local devices. Standard project resource. Uh-huh, I answered dumbfoundedly. I wondered what could possibly be inside my crate, but my thoughts were quickly answered. A microphone. Not the standard kind of microphone you'd see on a TV music show, but similar. Something wasn't right here. But my thoughts once again, guiltily, fell on the money. I collected my item from the crate and the cables provided with it before heading back to win. All set? You bet. What you've got for me? A microphone and a control terminal, I said, realizing how strange that sounded. It said to lower them down and relay whatever we record to the terminal. I glanced across to Alara, who was already busy setting it up. 
Correct, she said dismissively. I turned back to Wynne. So, do you need to drill now or? Done actually. Pretty cool, right? It's high powered, precise and silent. I've never seen anything like it. But the reading shows it's definitely down there. How far down? I felt nervous asking the question. A giant hole into the earth had such an ominous air to it. Somewhere between five and six kilometers? He answered casually. My breath caught in my throat. That was a long way for such a short time. Oh, okay. Let's do this then. I muttered as Alara gave a remarkably professional thumbs up. Wynne smiled and removed the cap of the drilling hole, attaching the microphone to the winch kit supplied. He gave the all clear and we began lowering the huge spool of wire down the hole. All that was left was to wait for it to reach the bottom. I stood up, sure that Wynne could monitor the drilling hole side of things, and headed over to Alara. To be honest, just the idea of being so close to an open hole that far, regardless of the fact I probably couldn't fit my foot in it, was a bit too much for me. The well-dressed woman was crouched awkwardly in front of the terminal set. Noticing my presence, she reported the situation. Predictably, the microphone is already connected via signal to the terminal. Audio is all we're looking for, then we can leave. She said bluntly. Not looking forward to roasting marshmallows? I jested. The look she shot me was enough of an answer. I'm not the morning type, Mr. Carter, but please allow me to do the job I was assigned. And so I did. We sat and waited with nothing but the sound of unspooling wire to keep us company. The first few minutes were uneventful, the microphone occasionally hitting the side of the drill tunnel with a dull thud. In fact, I would have chalked this up as a really well constructed prank if it wasn't for the obviously expensive equipment we'd been provided. It just begged the question of who the supplier was, but I had nothing but Keelan Research Center to go on. What kind of data were they looking for anyhow? For a project like this, I would have expected mineral withdrawal or deep drill sampling. Audio seemed pointless. Just as I was about to suggest, this was pointless and we were probably never getting paid. Something on the terminal moved. A stable audio trace. Alara muttered, mostly to herself. And it's not the sound of microphone hitting the sides anymore. Listen. I drew my body closer to the terminal and listened as intently as I could. There was the sound of the wire unspooling, but it quickly stopped. It must have reached its full length. I continued pressing my ear towards the terminal and finally heard it. It was faint, but it was a noise. Alara, can you amplify it? I asked, struggling to hear the continuous sound. It didn't hit home just yet, the thought of what the sound could be. Tapping away at the terminal, Alara applied some form of amplification. I'll just increase it too. Screams. Blood curdling, horrifying screams. The screams of someone being disemboweled and flayed alive. It sounded like a dying, cornered animal, but human, so human and raw. I stumbled away from the terminal and Lara squealed. Shit, shit, shit! I shouted, blocking my ears. The screams intensified like a helpless victim being set on fire and torched alive. Nguyen came running over, asking what was wrong. We didn't have to answer for him to understand. Fuck this, we're leaving, the hell with the money, I shouted, kicking myself away from the terminal and standing up. 
nobody protested, and we ran straight for the vehicle. We left behind the drill, the microphone, and the terminal that wouldn't stop unleashing those wretched, howling screams. The sound burned into my ears. I slammed the door shut, hitting the ignition. I didn't want to, but on instinct, I caught a look through the rearview mirror. The terminal showed a different color to before. It was plain white, with bold black letters. Data sent. Smiley face. The screen turned off. I turned around and floored it. We didn't look back. None of us spoke. Nobody said a word for the hours we drove through the Tenomai Desert. We eventually returned to Alice Springs and quickly met the men who held our signs for us upon arrival. My instinct was to interrogate them, to shout at them or obtain answers. But after a few quick questions, it was clear he knew nothing. He did, however, have our tickets back home. We parted ways at the airport, taking our separate flights back home. Never again did I hear of the company, Keelan Research, nor did I ever want to.